BioWave is a medical device that delivers high frequency signals through skin directly to nociceptive pain fibers where an electrical field forms to block the transmission of the pain signal to the brain. Uh, it works much like Novocaine, a chemical anesthetic, except the electrical field is blocking the pain signal electrically instead of chemically. BioWave is a very simple to use system, but the the way that the electrodes are placed is completely different than how you've been taught with conventional TENS or interferential or other types of electrical stimulation. So it's very important to understand the rationale for our electrode placement. So I'm going to start by explaining our signal technology and that will provide the rationale. In order to affect a nerve fiber or pain fiber inside the body, you have to encompass that nerve with a low frequency electrical field. We define low frequency 1 hertz to about 180 hertz in frequency. The problem is skin has very high impedance and high capacitance and low frequency signals, regardless of the shape of the waveform, cannot pass through skin. They only travel across the surface of the skin and that's a fundamental problem with TENS. High frequency signals, we define that as greater than 1000 Hz in frequency, particularly if they're a sinusoidal waveform, can pass through skin into deep tissue. But individually, high frequency signals have no effect on nociceptive pain fibers. What we discovered, we proved in a rabbit model at Cornell at New York Hospital. And what we discovered, and we had five probes inside the body of the rabbit, is when you add together two high frequency signals, both sinusoidal waveforms pass through the skin into deep tissue, we discovered when they, the charge at the surface of the nociceptive pain fibers, the plus charge, or the polarity of those nerves or any tissue inside the body causes these two high frequency signals to multiply together. And the multiplication of these two sine waves causes a new spectrum of signals to form in approximately a three inch diameter hemisphere beneath a two inch diameter electrode. Uh, this, the active electrical field that forms in this hemisphere is comprised of three high frequency signals and many low frequency signals. So what we discovered is a way to get the body to produce low frequency internally right at the surface of the nociceptive pain fibers. Then we did our first human study at Cornell at New York Hospital, and we discovered there was an optimal set of high frequency signals to get energy to pass through skin, and there was an optimal low frequency signal that formed inside the body that prevented the sodium potassium ion exchange across the membrane of the C fiber. So it prevents, the electrical field prevents action potential propagation along the C fiber. So it turns out, um, we, we looked at different high frequency signals going through the skin and different low frequency signals that formed inside the body and it turns out a specific low frequency electrical field right at the surface of the nociceptive pain fibers, it caused the greatest reduction in pain scores and visual analog scale pain scores from before to after treatment. So it allowed us to design a very simple to use device. There's no programming. Uh, the only thing that's controlled is the intensity and the patient controls it by pressing the plus button or the minus button on the face of the device. So this is very simple to use. It's power button and plus button. What's the device really doing? Uh, this device is a two electrode system and the device sums together the two high frequencies and delivers them to the first electrode. When they pass through the first electrode we get this three inch diameter hemisphere where this active electrical field takes place. This is an alternating current system. So what that means is the device alternates the delivery of the two summed high frequencies to the two electrodes. So instantaneously after it delivers it to the first electrode, the device delivers the two summed high frequencies to the second electrode. And the electrical field forms in this three inch diameter hemisphere beneath the second electrode. And so the device continues to alternate the delivery back and forth so quickly between the two electrodes, the body never realizes the signals have left either location. So the net effect, it's as if you're treating two distinct volumes of tissue simultaneously. Since the active electrical field forms in this hemisphere beneath the first electrode and in this hemisphere beneath the second electrode, the electrodes must be placed directly 
over locations of pain. We never surround the pain site like you do with interferential tens or other forms of stimulation. The way we focus signals to different parts of the body is by changing the ratio of the area of the electrodes relative to one another. If you have two electrodes and they're the same area, the density of the electrical field is the same under each electrode, the area is the same. So we can treat two distinct locations of pain. So if you have a patient with bilateral lumbar pain, we can place one electrode three inches to the left of the spine, a second electrode three inches to the right of the spine, they'd be directly over pain locations, and the patient feels nothing on the skin in between the electrodes. They only feel the sensation of the active electrical field in the hemispheres beneath each electrode. But Let's, and, and one of the things, these electrodes are independent of one another. There's no maximum distance as they move further apart. The strength of the electrical field doesn't change. They're completely independent of one another, which is different than conventional stimulation. But let's say, let's say you have a single location of pain. Then we pair a smaller area electrode with a larger dispersive pad. The electrical field, the density of the electrical field is much greater under the smaller electrode. So that small electrode is gonna go directly over the single location of pain. Um, the bigger electrode is still active, but it, the, uh, the, it's a larger area. So the electrical field is spread out over that larger area. The density is less. The, the strength of the sensation is much less. And so you're, the patient's not gonna feel as much under that electrode. But in addition, we wanna place this larger electrode over a location that's comfortable to receive stimulation because we only want the patient limited in how high they go up in intensity by what they can tolerate under the smaller electrode. We don't want the bigger electrode to act like a distraction. So the comfortable location to always place the bigger electrode is going to be over a bony prominence. So let's do an example. Let's say you have a patient with some, some type of shoulder pain. Let's say it's a biceps tendonitis. So, that, uh, so the patient's gonna point to the center of where it hurts. That's where the small electrode is going to be placed. The larger electrode, the comfortable bony prominence location is going to be along the spine of scapula. So we're gonna take the front corner of this electrode, we're gonna be right behind the posterior to the AC joint, and we're gonna run this at an angle right along the spine of scapula. It's a super comfortable place to receive stimulation. The patient's only limited in how high they go up by what they can tolerate under the small electrode, which is right over the, lo the single location of pain. So to make it easy, we created this quick reference guide. And this becomes the cheat sheet that you can use during uh, the initial time period that you're using the device. And it helps you come up the learning curve. So in this quick reference guide, we show um, all the different locations around the body as to how and where you place the electrodes. Um, and this is an, an important tool. Um, before we get into uh, the going over all the locations of the body, um, let's go over the nomenclature of the electrodes. There's three different size set electrodes. This first set that I showed you where we where we have two same size electrodes, we call that the B set. B stands for back or bilateral pain, but it's really for two locations of pain. And we can use this on any location of the body. Uh, typically, if you're on the lumbar area of the back, we're only using this size set, the B set, okay? For single locations of pain on the extremities, we use this set that I demonstrated before. This is called the E set. E is for extremity pain, uh, single locations of pain in the extremities. So this, you would use this set for a single location of pain on the neck, the shoulder, elbow, wrist, hand, finger, knee, foot, or ankle, but not in the mid torso part of the body where we're dealing with larger muscle groups and, and deeper nerves. For the mid torso part of the body, we have for single locations of pain, we have the U set. U stands for unilateral or single location of pain. And this is a two inch 
diameter pain sight electrode paired with a much larger 5 by 8 inch dispersive pad. This would be for treating single locations of pain on the quadriceps, the hamstring, the hip, uh, oblique, a rib, a rib contusion, uh, but we do not use this to treat unilateral low back pain. If we're, tre if we're on the back, we're using the B-set, even if it's a single location of pain. So that's how we split up the different size sets of electrodes for treating different locations on the body. When the low frequency field forms in this hemisphere beneath this two inch diameter electrode, there's several mechanisms of action that occur. One is, as I mentioned before, the, uh, where the electrical field is uh, preventing the sodium-potassium ion exchange across the membrane of the C-fiber. But this electrical field is not specific just to C-fibers. It affects all polarized tissue. On the A-delta fibers, the electrical field induces hyposthesia. So about five minutes into the treatment, a light numbness forms. There's a little loss of proprioception at the skin surrounding where each electrode is placed. And so that's a secondary effect, uh, a second effect. Um, at the end of a 30-minute duration treatment, there's about 15 minutes of residual hyposthesia. That hyposthesia uh, wears off over that period, but there's ongoing pain relief, and that pain relief can last for up to 24 hours. Um, in addition, there's increased blood flow through this hemisphere. It's not from vasodilation. It's because if components of blood have a, have a charge on it, if a charged particle hits an electrical field, it has to be accelerated through that field. So increased blood flow is a secondary benefit of the treatment. The other thing we know is muscle tissue is polarized, and the effect the electrical field has on the muscle tissue is it holds it in tension during the treatment. So the treatment feels like a deep, smooth pressure sensation. It's extremely comfortable, so patient compliance is excellent. In our clinical studies, we have found, and in real-world use, 81% of patients typically respond to BioWave's high-frequency neurostimulation. Uh, those that respond typically have anywhere from a 50% reduction in their VAS pain score up to a 75% reduction in their VAS pain score from before to after treatment, as well as a significant reduction in uh, stiffness, a significant improvement in range of motion, and reduction of muscle spasm. Uh, this pain relief and functional improvement can last for up to 24 hours with non-invasive electrodes and up to 72 hours with percutaneous electrodes. With BioWave, a single treatment is not a panacea. If a patient responds to a single treatment, they will always respond to subsequent treatments. Uh, cumulative multiple treatments can provide a cumulative benefit and so um, over time if a patient is treating at home as an example they may treat once a day or twice a day over the course of a month uh, they may find that they only need to treat every other day for another month and after that twice a week as a maintenance treatment. So there, there does appear to be some type of cumulative benefit that can occur by using BioWave's high-frequency neurostimulation. Safety. The edges of the electrodes must never touch each other. They physically cannot physically touch each other. Otherwise, the patient will receive a burn in five seconds. It'll be warm, hot, youch. So one inch is the minimum spacing on the back. Half an inch is the minimum spacing on the extremities. Um, having said that, there's software built into both our BioWave Pro and BioWave Home devices that prevents patients from getting a burn. The software calculates power density in real time at the surface of both electrodes. Above a certain power density, you burn the skin. 
right before the device gets to that unsafe level for that particular patient's skin impedance, it will reduce the intensity by about three percentage points in real time. Basically, the system is preventing the patient from going up too high in intensity and burning themselves. While that's happening, the plus button on the face of the device is disabled and it prevents the patient from going higher while it's throttling that signal back. So even in a clinic setting, if the patient is controlling the device or the patient has a BioWave home unit at home controlling the device, they can't burn themselves. It's part of our patented signal technology. Contraindications. Electrodes must be placed on intact skin. You cannot place an electrode over very rashy skin, over wounds, over incisions that have not yet healed. You can treat, for example, immediately post-surgery, say morning following surgery, and the electrode can be right next to an incision, but it can't be over the incision until it's healed. Once there's scar tissue, you can treat directly over scar tissue. Electrodes cannot be placed on top of the head, across the temples, or on the front or side of the neck. Electrodes cannot be placed over the heart on the anterior of the thorax. You can treat on uh, the, the left side of the rib cage. You can treat thoracically on the back. Um, any type of orthopedic hardware inside the body is totally fine. It's not a contraindication. So plates, screws, pins, clips, anchors, uh, any t uh, total joints, even shrapnel, any type of metal hardware inside the body is not a contraindication. The other contraindications are uh, patients prone to seizure, even though there's no negative data, and also electrically implanted devices like defibrillators or pacemakers. Again, there's no negative data, but uh, those are contraindicated. You can't use BioWave if you have one of those devices. Spinal implanted spinal cord stimulators, implanted peripheral nerve stimulators are fine. Typically there's a remote control. You can turn them off, which you need to turn them off first, and then you can treat with BioWave. Implanted pain pumps are not contraindicated. Pregnancy is not a contraindication. In fact, we have good results treating back and hip pain in pregnant patients. Pregnancy is just considered a warning. Um, also, cancer patients, is not, it's not a contraindication, it's just considered a warning. We have some anecdotal data that shows patients with pain resulting from cancer can also get a good pain relief. The key thing when determining correct electrode placement is to ask the patient how and where the pain presents. You need to determine, are there two locations of pain? Is there a single location of pain? That's gonna determine whether we're using the B-set electrodes for two locations of pain or the E-set electrodes for a single location of pain on the extremities or the U-set electrodes for a single location of pain in the mid-torso part of the body. So uh, in the example for low back pain, uh, we're going to start with um, bilateral lumbar pain. So I'm going to ask the patient, uh, we, we know the diagnosis ahead of time, can you point to the center of where it hurts? Here. And do you also have pain uh, on this side here? Okay. So. These are the locations that we want to place the electrodes because this is exactly where the pain is presenting. So the electrode peels off the plastic liner. We place one electrode directly over one location of pain. We place the second electrode directly over the second location of pain. And we orient the wires typically down so the weight of the connector does not pull on the electrode. Um, the patient feels nothing on the skin in between the electrodes. They only feel the sensation in the hemisphere beneath each of these two electrodes. The effect of the electrical field is not just beneath each electrode, it's a three inch diameter hemisphere beneath each electrode. 
So this is typical for bilateral lumbar pain. If the patient has a radiculopathy, and let's say the, the uh, diagnosis is a herniated disc at L5, uh, and it's a right side radiculopathy, one electrode is placed over the origin of the pain, and we actually want to be about half an inch to the right, so we're capturing where the pain signals are coming off of the spine. So instead of being right over the spine, we might be half an inch to the right if this is the origin of the pain. And then let's say the pain first presents in the lumbar area or the buttock area, we want to place the second electrode directly over the most proximal location that the pain presents relative to the origin. We never place this electrode distally, even if the patient feels pain radiating through their knee down to their foot. So if this was the primary, if this was the first location that the patient felt pain, then we would place this electrode right in this location, uh, if that's the most proximal location, and that's how we would treat a radiculopathy. Um, if a patient has um, pain uh, centered directly over a disc, let's say this is where the pain presents, we're going to place that one electrode right over the center of that pain site. Um, now, where do we place the second electrode? We want to put it over a bony prominence typically because that's a comfortable location. And on the spine, it's more comfortable to take stimulation lower. L5, S1, S2, as opposed to higher. So we would place this electrode uh, approximately here, and we want to leave one inch of spacing between the two electrodes. One inch is the minimum spacing between electrodes. Uh, very important, the electrodes can never touch each other. If the electrodes touch, the patient will receive a burn in five seconds. It'll be warm, hot, youch. So one inch is the minimum spacing on the back. Half an inch is the minimum spacing on the extremities. So this would be for a single location of pain here. The second electrode is placed in this location down here. Okay, let's do unilateral low back pain. Let's say the pain presents um, just to the right side of the spine in the single location. So again, you're asking the patient to point to the center of where the pain is. We're presuming that's the center of the location of pain. We place this electrode. Now, the bony prominence location, we want to have one inch of spacing. So we're going to take this electrode and we're going to move lower. So we're right over the, the spine close to the sacrum, it's a very comfortable place to take stimulation. We have one inch of spacing, and um, that's how we would place the electrodes for a single location of pain in the lumbar area on the back. For SI joint pain, um, the electrodes can be placed bilaterally over the SI joint. Um, but if the pain is right over the sacrum, we can place one over the sacrum and one can be an inch apart if there's a little more pain to the right side or if there's over the sacrum and there's a little bit more pain, we can place the second electrode uh, to the left side of the spine uh, or like I said, we can do a bilateral placement. This is an excellent treatment for SI joint pain. For the mid torso part of the body for single locations of pain, um, we use the U set. Um, U is for unilateral pain. Um, the U set is comprised of a two inch round pain sight electrode paired with a very large uh, dispersive pad, eight inches by five inches. So if the patient has hip pain, um, they have to point to the center of where the pain is. Let's say this is the location. We're going to place this lo this electrode right over the location that the pain presents on the hip, the single location of pain. And then this dispersive pad is always going to be placed across uh, the lumbar area of the body. It might start at S2 and go up from there. So this placement, um, this is the not just a bony prominence, it's just a convenient and very comfortable place to receive stimulation. So we can place this electrode just like this. So 
okay? And so this would be a typical placement for a hip issue. If you had a patient with an oblique strain, um, you know, depending upon wherever that pain site presents, the patient has to point to the center of where it is. Um, you're going to place that electrode right out over the location. If the patient has uh, a rib contusion um, or a rib fracture, you can treat right over a rib uh, to treat pain um, in that location. For hamstring strains or hamstring-related pain, uh, if it's a single location of pain, the two-inch round electrode goes right over wherever that pain site is. So if this is the center of where the, the pain site is, then this is where the electrode is going to be placed. If it's a high hamstring um, tendon issue and it's presenting pain's presenting here, then we're placing this directly on the skin, not over the shorts. Um, directly over the location where the pain presents. So again, you're, you're asking the patient how and where the pain presents, you're identifying the correct location, we're placing the two inch round electrode directly over the pain site. This is the comfortable location for the dispersive pad when we use the U-set. For quadriceps strains or other quadriceps related pain in the belly of the quadriceps, we still have that five inch by eight inch dispersive pad across the lower lumbar area. That's the comfortable location for that pad. And this two inch round pad is right over the belly of the quadriceps, wherever that painful uh, location presents. So that's for quadricep pain. For groin pain or a groin strain, the five inch by eight inch dispersive pad is in the same location. It's horizontally across the lumbar area and the two inch round pad can be placed either uh, uh, below or above uh, wherever that groin pain is presenting. Um, so you would use the U set again for groin related pain. The B set, in addition to treating two distinct locations of pain, can also be used to treat a large area of pain. So if these two electrodes are placed one inch apart from each other, um, we can capture a six inch by three inch volume of tissue or six inch by three inch volume of tissue. So if you have a patient and the pain is presenting over a large area of the lumbar area, starting in the, lumbar, in the lumbar area and moving up toward the thoracic area, if we place these electrodes um, one inch apart from one another, let's say the pain presents here, kind of through this whole region up through here, and you place these one inch apart like this, essentially you're gonna treat this entire volume of tissue on this part of the back. So this could apply to the hamstring if the pain's over a broad area of the hamstring or another part of the body where pain presents over a broad area, this is the way to treat a broader area of the pain. Use the two two inch diameter round electrodes one inch apart. For the knee, we can treat using either the B set or the E set single location of pain electrodes. Uh, so again, we want to ask the patient how and where the pain presents. Are there two locations of pain? Even if there's a primary location and a secondary location, we're going to use the B set. Is there a single location of pain? We're going to use the E set. So if a patient, for example, has a chronic OA knee pain and uh, maybe they've got grade three or grade four osteoarthritis, there's pain through the entire joint, um, it's not point specific, then uh, a good way to, to, to treat that type of pain is to place the electrodes, one on the medial aspect or joint and joint line of the knee and one on the lateral joint line of the knee. And this way we're getting an electrical field uh, and the, the hemispheres will intersect internally and we can treat the entire knee. Um, if the pain uh, is from, say, you had a, an ACL repair 
and the pain tends to be a little bit more toward the anterior of the knee and perhaps uh, the patellar tendon was used or a ha hamstring tendon was used uh, and the pain might present a little bit more to the medial side but sometimes on an ACL it might feel like it's throughout the entire anterior of the knee. We could place one electrode closer to the anterior and the other one closer to the anterior of the knee so they're not as far back as in the other example and there's only half an inch of spacing here between the electrodes and if the patellar tendon was used you can be right on either side of the incision here and this is a, a good way to treat perhaps pain from a post-op ACL. For pain from a patellar tendinopathy, that typically presents right where the patellar tendon is. Again, you have to ask your patient to point to the center of where the pain is. If that's the location, we're going to place this small electrode directly over the center of where it hurts. The larger electrode, the bony prominence comfortable location for it, is we're going to place it on the lateral aspect of the knee. We're going to be about two-thirds or three-quarters of the way up the lateral side of the patella. We're going to touch that and run this vertically down the lateral side of the knee. Uh, the nuance of this placement is we do not want this electrode to touch the distal end of the quadriceps because remember muscles held in tension. So um, if this is held in tension, it's not going to be uncomfortable, but it may act like a distraction and the patient may not want to go up as high as if, as if this were in a comfortable location to receive stimulation. We don't want to limit the patient in how high they go up by what they feel under the dispersive pad. We want them to only be limited in what they can tolerate by what they feel under the pain site electrode. And in this case, we're, we're, it's a, we're, where the pain is, it's over the uh, patellar tendon. Um, the other thing is we don't want this dispersive electrode on the lateral side of the knee to be more posterior because back here, uh, if the electrode covers over the perineal nerve, we can stimulate the perineal nerve and the stimulation that one feels along that nerve, again, may act like a distraction. So we don't want to be more posterior with this dispersive electrode. Some people ask, well, why not place it over the tibial tuberosity? just not as comfortable to take stimulation there. So stay off uh, the distal end of the quadriceps, stay away from the perineal nerve. This, tends, this is a good location. For pain on the medial side of the knee, like an MCL sprain or bursitis or OA or a meniscal issue, uh, let's say the pain presents right here. The patient points to the center of where it hurts. We place the electrode over the pain site. Now the ideal bony prominence comfortable location for the dispersive pad is we're going to touch the lateral aspect of the patella. Again, we're about three quarters of the way up the patella on the lateral side and we angle it across the anterior of the knee, across the patellar tendon. This is the most comfortable place to take stimulation in the knee. So unlike the patellar tendinopathy where we're vertical, we actually want to come across the anterior of the knee. If the patient has um, quadriceps tendinitis. Perhaps that presents up in this location superior to the joint. We place this electrode right over the center of where the pain presents. Same bony prominence comfortable location for the dispersive pad. Touch the lateral aspect of the patella, come across the patellar tendon. If there's pain on the lateral side of the knee, an LCL sprain, bursitis, OA, or whatever might be causing pain on the lateral side, we place the small electrode directly over wherever that, the center of that pain site is. Now there's not enough room to be on the lateral side here because the electrodes can't be far enough apart, so we do the mirror image. We touch the medial side of the patella, three quarters of the way up, and we come across uh, the patellar tendon um, this way. We stay off the VMO, the distal end of the quadriceps. Uh, again, we don't want to hold this in tension. And um, this is a very comfortable location in, for treating anything on the lateral side of the knee. For IT band issues, iliotibial band pain, um, a lot of times that pain may present a little more proximal to the joint. So let's say this is where the IT band pain presents. Uh, even though we're on the lateral side of the knee generally, now there's room to 
go back to the lateral side here of the patella and across the patellar tendon. So for IT band pain, this would be the ideal placement. Now, if the IT band pain presents in two locations, perhaps it presents not only in this location, but further up the IT band, then we can go back to using the B set and we can place one electrode over one location of pain and the second electrode over the second location of pain, or it could be all the way up uh, uh, higher up on the IT band, but this is going directly over wherever that, pain, wherever that second pain site might be. Okay, so that might be uh, IT band where there's two locations of pain. For foot and ankle pain, uh, the ideal bony prominence location to place uh, the dispersive electrode is always going to be over the lateral malleolus. So as an example, um, this electrode will get placed typically in this location but we're always going to place the pain site electrode first because we want to make sure we're over the pain site and then we'll determine if there's enough spacing for this uh, bony prominence location. So if you have a patient with an ankle sprain and the pain presents right here, ankle or foot sprain, we're going to place this electrode first and then this bony prominence location will leave half an inch of spacing and this will come out over the malleolus and a little bit around the Achilles, if you could bend up just a little like that. Um, so that would be a typical placement for, say, a foot or ankle sprain. If a patient had uh, plantar fasciitis, this electrode is going to go right over the plantar fascia. Um, I don't know if you, if you can see that. Uh, so this is right over the pain site on the plantar fascia. This electrode is actually, we can place this um, a little bit further uh, forward. So we're over the malleolus and just to the back of where the Achilles starts. And this is a, a comfortable place to take stimulation in the foot. If the pain is on the medial side of the foot, um, so we could, you know, let's say uh, the pain presents uh, you know, whether it's more posterior or anterior, wherever this is, we're going to place this electrode over the pain site. Again, this gets placed on the lateral malleolus, uh, on the opposite side of, of the ankle here. Um, the reason we don't place this electrode over the medial malleolus is because this electrode can capture the tibial nerve running through here. And if the, if we capture the tibial nerve, the patient can feel some stimulation from the, uh, the tibial nerve under their arch to their big toe. Again, it can act like a distraction and the patient may be limited in how high they go up because of this distraction that they're feeling here. So we never place this electrode on the medial malleolus for that reason. Um, if there's pain and it's over where the tibial nerve passes through and if we capture it, doesn't matter then if you feel the stimulation because we want to treat over the pain site and that's what's most important. For Achilles tendonitis, there's three ways to place the electrodes based on how the pain presents. If the pain only presents up higher on the Achilles tendon, then we're going to place one electrode right over the Achilles where the pain presents. And then uh, instead of the lateral malleolus, we're actually going to go lateral part of the foot and around the calcaneus so that we're capturing the insertion point of the Achilles with the second electrode. If the pain only presents at the insertion point of the Achilles tendon, then we're going to take this electrode, we're going to be right over the insertion point where the pain presents, and then this second electrode can run vertically up the Achilles. Um, you want to make sure that if you're going to do any activity with your patient that you put them in plantar flexion to make sure that these two electrodes don't touch each other. Uh, so if you're placing the electrodes and, and the tibia is at 90 degrees to the foot, uh, make sure you're leaving more than one inch of spacing here because when you go into plantar flexion, you can see how much closer they come together and we don't want them to touch as the patient may be doing activity during the biowave treatment. The third way to do an Achilles tendonitis 
placement is to use the B set. And that's if the patient has pain both at the insertion point and further up the Achilles tendon. So this way we're getting kind of an equal treatment all along the Achilles. So we can place one electrode right over the insertion point if that's one of the locations where pain is being where pain is presenting and we can place the second electrode um, on the Achilles further up the Achilles um, just again make sure there's enough spacing just in case you are going to do any activity we don't want the edges of these two electrodes to touch so this is we, we're treating this entire region of the Achilles tendon when we treat over the Achilles tendon use tape or cohesive wrap to help hold these electrodes in place. We're going over a tight contour here and the electrodes may want to tend to peel back a little bit. So a little bit of compression with tape or wrap is good because you're forcing the hydrogel into the pores of the skin. For two locations of pain on the foot or ankle, then we're going to use the B-set and cover those two locations of pain. So for example, if a patient has a high ankle sprain and perhaps the pain presents on the lateral or anterior part of the ankle, let's say that's one pain location and perhaps there's medial side compression pain on the other side of the foot or ankle, um, we can place the two electrodes uh, directly over the two locations of pain that present. They could be two locations of pain on the same side, on opposite sides, it doesn't matter. But if there are two locations of pain, then use the B-set electrodes to cover those two locations of pain. For neck pain, if there's a single location of pain, we're going to use the E-set electrodes. Uh, so the patient has to point to the center of where the pain is. Let's say this is the location where the pain presents. Uh, we can treat right over the spine. We can treat right up to the base of the skull. So the electrode can be right, it has to be over skin. Uh, so you have good adhesion. And then the bony prominence location for the second electrode is always going to be along the spine of scapula. So this front corner of the electrode can be just posterior to the AC joint and then right along the spine of scapula here is where we want to run this electrode. So it's running at a little bit of an angle relative to uh, how the shoulders run. And you can feel the spine of scapula right here. It's a very comfortable place to take stimulation. So the patient's only limited in how high they go up in intensity by what they tolerate over the single electrode directly over the pain site. For two locations of pain on the neck, um, the electrodes, there, there's ways to do that. So it depends how and where the pain presents. If the patient has bilateral neck pain and the pain presents uh, here and here, or here and here, or here and here, uh, we can place electrodes over those two locations. Okay, and this would be a typical bilateral neck pain placement. Uh, a lot of times patients in a very common treatment we find is patients may have pain on one side of their neck and they also have a secondary location of pain or maybe the pain radiates down into the trapezius and so we want to treat both where the pain originates or is in the neck and also where the pain presents perhaps in the in the trapezius. This um, would be a very common uh, neck pain type placement. Um, if a patient had a cervical radiculopathy and it originates at, let's say, C3, and the most proximal location of pain is in the trapezius, this would also be for a cervical radiculopathy. If the pain doesn't, if the first most proximal location the pain presents is closer to the shoulder, then we would place this electrode over where that pain presents in the shoulder. We would never place this second electrode distally, even if the patient feels pain radiating down through their elbow or down to their fingertips. We want to capture where the pain presents, again, the first location that the pain presents that's closest to the origin. If a patient has uh, pain directly over one of the cervical discs, we can place one electrode uh, directly over that location. The second electrode can go uh, uh, an inch below it, 
And so we can actually capture um, up to three or four cervical discs with this placement. And the hemispheres beneath these electrodes are, are inter intersecting internally. So we're really treating this one large region of pain. If there could be pain over multiple discs or pain just over a, a single disc. When we treat on the neck, many times electrodes don't stick well to the back of the neck, either because of fine hairs or oil or other uh, uh, other types of, of, of skin conditions. And so we highly recommend taking tape and putting tape from one side all the way across to the other side here to help hold the electrodes in place. Even if this is just a static treatment and the patient is not moving, um, we always place tape over the electrodes when we're on the neck to help hold, keep them in good contact with the skin. So we want the hydrogel getting through the pores of the skin so we have good electrical conduction, which will translate into better efficacy if we have good conduction through the skin. For shoulder pain, um, we're going to start with the anterior of the shoulder. So let's say the patient has a single location of pain. Again, we ask the patient, how and where does the pain present? Are there two locations of pain? Is there a single location of pain? So let's say in this case, there's a single location of pain and the patient points here. Uh, let's say it's a biceps tendonitis or it could be a slap issue or a supraspinatus strain. Um, they're all gonna present in a similar location on the anterior of the shoulder. So let's say that's the location the pain's presenting. That's where we place that electrode. The bony prominence comfortable location for the second electrode is the same as it was for the neck. We wanna be along the spine of scapula. So if you can rotate this way, um, the uh, this electrode, we're gonna be just posterior to the AC joint, and the spine of scapula is right here. We're gonna be right along uh, the spine of scapula. Extremely comfortable place to take stimulation. The patient's getting a little bit of a treatment in through this location, but most of the sensation and most of the treatment is occurring in this hemisphere beneath the smaller electrode directly over the pain site. For an AC sprain, uh, if, you know, the pain's going to present right over the AC joint. Uh, we're going to place this electrode right over that location that the pain presents, and this is a great treatment for AC sprains. Uh, again, this, uh, the bony prominence comfortable location for this electrode is right along the spine of scapula. This time, we're not quite as far uh, forward, we're more posterior uh, along the spine of scapula because we're allowing for this spacing between these two electrodes. So this is still a comfortable location along the spine of scapula and we're right over the pain site. For pain on the posterior of the shoulder, um, like this side or that side? Actually, this one would be better maybe from this angle. So yeah. whether it's an infraspinatus issue or a posterior rotator cuff, uh, we're going to place the single electrode directly over wherever the pain presents on the posterior of the shoulder. Again, we want to go spine of scapula, but now we want to still make sure we have enough spacing between the electrodes. So this might look more like this, and the spine of scapula is right about here, but we, ha we, we need to maintain enough spacing between the electrodes. Still very comfortable location to take stimulation. Uh, most of the sensation is felt in this hemisphere beneath the small 1.38 inch diameter electrode. For shoulder pain that originates in the trapezius, again, the patient points to the center of where the pain is. If it's a single location of pain, we place the one electrode in that location. Again, the bony prominence positioning for the dispersive pad is going to be just posterior to the AC joint and the spine of, we're gonna be right along the spine of scapula. So this might be a typical placement for a single location of trapezius pain. For shoulder pain, where there's two distinct locations of pain, for example, both the anterior of the shoulder and the posterior of the shoulder, uh, or if pain occurs inside the joint and the patient cannot identify a single location of pain around the shoulder, then um, we use the B-set. 
So if someone has general pain inside the joint, I would have these two electrodes, one on the anterior, one on the posterior. I'd be up closer to the AC joint, so you're on a little bit bonier tissue. I'd be uh, right over kind of the, the beginning of the spine of scapula. Maybe we're only an inch apart, and the electrodes are at an angle like this, and the electrical field is being driven down into the joint like that. That's for general pain inside the joint. But let's say uh, the patient has two locations of pain. They have pain over the head of the biceps tendon, and they have pain somewhere on the posterior of the shoulder. Um, then you could use the B set to treat like this, and we're treating a distinct location of pain here, and we're treating a distinct location of pain here. So you can use the B set uh, for treating pain if that's how it presents. If the patient says they have pain in their deltoid, uh, but the diagnosis is really the pain is originating from the joint, I, it would be better to tr put, place the small pain site electrode closer to the joint on the bonier prominence uh, toward the, the top of the shoulder. Um, the, we don't like placing this directly over the deltoid because the deltoid is a muscle that will fatigue more easily as the patient goes to higher intensities versus other muscle locations. So if the pain originates in the deltoid and that's where the pain site is, then I would place the pain site electrode in this location. But if the pain is really in the joint and it's radiating down to the deltoid, you'd get a better treatment result treating up closer to the joint on the harder tissue. If you're over a bonier prominence, you can tolerate a, a greater signal strength. The patient can go up to a higher intensity. Again, the second electrode is along the spine of scapula um, uh, as, as with the other placements. And again, um, you can place some tape over the electrodes to help hold them in place, uh, if, um, particularly if your patient is going to be doing any type of active or passive range of motion during the treatment. If you're going to do active or passive range of motion on a shoulder, before you start the treatment, you want to make sure that these electrodes are not going to touch. So you want to range your patient through the entire range of motion and make sure that these two, the edges of the electrodes don't touch. Um, once you've checked that, then the patient can go back to um, their uh, neutral position and you can hook up the electrodes and, and begin the treatment. For elbow pain, like a medial epicondylitis, a lateral epicondylitis, uh, triceps tendonitis, we can treat those two different ways. Uh, if, the, if the pain is really point specific and the patient tends to be a little more sensitive to stimulation because the elbow is a more sensitive uh, location to receive stimulation, we can use the E-set and the single um, electrode is placed directly over the single pain site on the elbow. Again, we use the spine of scapula as the bony prominence location uh, for um, the, uh, the dispersive electrode. So for example, for lateral epicondylitis, if the pain presents right in this location, we're gonna place this electrode right over that one spot. Uh, and again, the, the bony prominence location is here. For medial epicondylitis, rotate a little bit more. For medial epicondylitis, if the pain presents, uh, you know, right, say, in this location, then the small electrode is placed right over that location. Again, the bony prominence location for the other electrode is along the spine of scapula where we had it before. For triceps tendonitis, um, if the pain presents at the distal end of the triceps here, uh, we're going to place this electrode right over the location that that pain presents. So those are the three typical locations that we treat around the elbow. An alternative way for treating elbow pain is to use 
the B set, the two same size electrodes, because we can hit the joint from two different angles and feedback that we get from the field, for example, from Major League Baseball, where pitchers typically uh, have uh, medial epicondylitis from repetitive motion from throwing, as an example, we find we're getting better treatment results by treating not only the medial epicondyle, but placing the second electrode over the distal end of the triceps. So the typical placement for a medial epicondylitis would be we would place one electrode over uh, where the pain presents on the medial epicondyle, and then the second electrode would be placed on the, dis on the distal end of the triceps uh, in this location, and this way, uh, and you can see we have enough spacing uh, between the two electrodes here, and this way uh, we're hitting the elbow from, from two locations. So similarly, if we were going to treat lateral epicondylitis, we would place this one electrode over the lateral epicondyle, and the second electrode, again, would be in this location, posterior uh, part of the elbow, distal end of the triceps. So we'd be hitting the elbow from these two locations, and we find that we get a better treatment result. So the preference for elbow pain would be to treat with the B-set on the elbow. This placement would also be for triceps tendonitis. So if the pain presented on the posterior of the elbow, then the first electrodes here, I would place the second electrode on the lateral side here, and again, you're hitting it from two sides. The only time I would go to the single electrode placement if a patient's more sensitive to stimulation and they don't want both uh, electrodes on the elbow, but you will get a very focused treatment using the smaller electrode directly over that pain site location. So that's uh, uh, this is the alternative or maybe preferential method for treating elbow pain. When we do elbow treatments, we want to roll up a towel. It's typically available in a physical therapy clinic or athletic training setting uh, because we want to keep the fingers in a comfortable position. If we're treating over the ulnar nerve, the electrical field captures the ulnar nerve. It wants to pull the pinky and ring finger in and wrist uh, inwards, so this keeps the patient in a comfortable position. The patient can operate the intensity of the device with their other hand. For wrist, hand, and finger, um, we typically use the E-set because the region that we're treating is so small in volume, we're going to capture uh, the entire wrist or finger or hand, wherever the location is that we're treating. So for pain on the wrist, that's on the anterior of the wrist, if this is where the pain presents, we're going to place this electrode directly over that location. Uh, we're typically going to place the electrodes in an opposing fashion. So the dispersive electrode is going to go across the posterior of the wrist, and you want to make sure there's enough spacing between the edges of the two uh, electrodes here. And because, again, we're going over a tight contour, you want to take tape or cohesive wrap and wrap it around the electrode so we have good uh, uh, adhesion to the skin and conduction through the skin by pressing the, the hydrogel into the pores of the skin. If the patient has small diameter wrists and you're worried that the edges of the electrodes are going to be too close, then instead of being across the wrist, we can be partially on the back of the hand and run the electrode this way so we don't have a problem with um, uh, the, the electrodes potentially touching. Stay off the forearms, the, the softer tissue there is not as comfortable to receive stimulation. If you are treating posterior of the wrist, then again, we're right over wherever the pain presents. The we're going to place the dispersive pad across the anterior of the wrist. Again, um, we want to go directly across, use tape or wrap to hold this in place. If the wrist is too small, you can be partially up on the palm of the hand and along the wrist this way. Again, use tape um, to help hold these electrodes in place uh, so that you have good adhesion because we're going over uh, not a completely flat location. For um, a TFCC issue, which may present on the, uh, on, on the side of, of the wrist, we can place this electrode right over that location. This 
second dispersive electrode can be in an opposing location. So again, you've got enough spacing here on this side, and you've got enough spacing on um, the other side of the wrist as well. If you were treating a, a UCL sprain um, at the base of the thumb, um, wherever that the pain presents, we can be right over that location. We can be in a, an opposing location on the other side of the wrist when we're, when we're treating anywhere around the base of the thumb. If you're treating a phalangeal or interphalangeal joint, so for example, uh, you're, 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 this is the location. Again, use tape to hold this electrode in place and, and snugly around the phalangeal or interphalangeal joint and we can just go posterior of the wrist with the dispersive pad. And again, use tape or wrap around this electrode as well. So those are the placements for wrist and hand pain. When we treat the wrist, hand, or finger, we want to roll up a towel that are typically available in a physical therapy uh, location and have the patient hold uh, the towel. And the purpose of this is to keep their fingers in a comfortable location. For example, if we were treating over the ulnar nerve, uh, the, uh, the stimulation wants to pull the pinky and ring finger in and pull the wrist this way. And we want to keep the hand in a comfortable position. So by doing this, we keep the hand in a comfortable position. If we were capturing the radial nerve, it may want to pull the, the middle finger up like this. So again, the patient holds the uh, towel to keep their fingers in a comfortable position. The patient can operate the device with their other hand. Body position during the treatment is important and it's, uh, it can help provide a better treatment outcome. The key is we want the tissue being treated to be in a taut or slightly stretched position. So if we're treating the lumbar area, we do not want the patient prone on a table. We want them sitting with their torso at 90 degrees to the legs because now the tissue in the lumbar area and the buttock area is more taut. We'll get deeper penetration of the electrical field. If we're treating the neck, we actually want the head forward slightly because if the tissue on the back of the neck is more taut, you're going to get deeper penetration of the electrical field when we're on the neck. If we're treating a shoulder, just a neutral position with the shoulder is fine. If you were going to range the shoulder, then you could have the patient supine on the table, and then they would be in a position after eight minutes of treatment to start doing you know, passive or, or assisted active range of motion uh, on, their, on their shoulder. Um, if you're treating an elbow, kind of a comfortable neutral position is fine. Um, Wrist, hand, finger, as, I sh as I've shown in a prior segment, uh, we're rolling up a towel to keep the fingers in a comfortable location. Um, and same with the elbow. Uh, for the knee, we always want the knee at 90 degrees here uh, because that's going to provide the strongest sensation inside the joint. Um, the only time the knee's at zero degrees is if, if we're treating uh, the posterior of the knee. Then the posterior of the knee would be in a, in a stretched position. For foot and ankle, um, typically the foot or ankle is going to be at 90 degrees to the tibia. Um, the patient can be seated in a chair with their feet flat on the floor. That tends to be the most comfortable position. If only a table is available, they can sit up on the table and have their feet uh, sticking out along the table where they're, they could be sit, lying down with their knees at 90 degrees and the f feet flat on the table. There's, it's really what's most comfortable for the patient, but generally if the foot's at about 90 to the tibia, that tends to be um, the best position for doing a foot or ankle treatment. Um, if we're treating a hamstring, um, we want the torso at 90 degrees to the legs and we want the knee at zero so the hamstring is going to be taut. If we're treating a quadriceps, sitting off the end of the table, having the knee at 90 and treating the quadriceps is the most comfortable position to treat uh, quadriceps. If we're treating um, uh, the hip or the groin, we want the patient supine on the table and you could even place a pillow under their buttock so this area of the body here is in a stretch position. So supine on the table for groin and for hip. 
Motion during the treatment is also an important concept and can influence the outcome of the treatment. Uh, when one moves, uh, the impedance of the tissue changes. And as the impedance of the tissue changes, the sensation felt by the patient can increase or decrease depending upon the impedance change. So one, the patient needs to be aware that if they move during the treatment, the sensation can adjust up or down, uh, but our software limits how much that happens. So it's not a sharp adjustment. It's still a very comfortable treatment. But the other interesting thing that happens with this, the, when, when someone moves, say you're treating a shoulder as they move through a, a range of motion, the location of the electrical field can also shift. So if you're treating a shoulder, for example, and a patient's in a neutral position, and we've got one small electrode over the anterior of the shoulder, if the patient were to go, do, go into some internal rotation and they went this way, they may move like this and go, oh, wow, that's hitting the spot. That's a very important concept. If moving causes the sensation to be more focused and encompass the point of pain, that will provide a better treatment outcome. Similarly, if you were treating an elbow and um, let's say, depending upon supination, pronation, flexion, extension, angle of the elbow, uh, the, the electrode is here, but the patient felt more of the stimulation in their forearm radiating down to their fingertips. Um, uh, you're not gonna get as good a treatment result as if the patient gently moved, and let's say they went to this position, and they said, oh, wow, that's hitting the spot. That's a good thing. So we want the sensation from the electrical field to be focused, encompassing the point of pain here, and you don't want to feel the sensation of the electrical field radiating down to the fingertips. So gently articulating a joint during a treatment uh, slowly so you can focus the electrical field around the sensation from the electrical field around the point of pain is an important concept and that will provide a better treatment outcome if the patient really can get it focused. We have two different protocols for uh, using BioWave. One is a static treatment protocol, and the other is a dynamic protocol. It's actually doing active or passive range of motion during the biowave treatment. For a static pain treatment protocol, we want to make sure the body, the tissue, is in a taut or slightly stretched position, and then the patient's going to stay in that position for the entire 30-minute duration treatment. Now, in a sports setting, uh, typically we want to do a minimum of two treatments. We want to treat before practice of the game, and, uh, but what happens is during practice of the game, the athlete may be re-aggravating their partic particular condition, so we also want to do a second treatment after practice of the game. And the multiple treatments provide a cumulative benefit, much more so than any single treatment. Um, heat can be used before practice of the game. Ice uh, or cold therapy is very commonly used in combination with BioWave after practice of the game. Um, so that's the, the typical static pain treatment protocol. In a physical therapy setting, we're talking typically about a single 30-minute uh, session or in a VA hospital setting, a, a, in a pain clinic, as an example, a, a static 30-minute session would be a, a single treatment in a day. The dynamic treatment, or we call it neuromodulation during activity, is we want to first place wrap over the electrodes. Um, so we want it, it could be a, a cohesive wrap, it could be tape, it could be a Velcro strap. We want to hold the electrodes in place because the patient is going to begin active 
or you can do passive range of motion with, with that patient. So we put tape or wrap around the electrodes to hold them in place. We do a static treatment for eight minutes. Eight minutes because we want the effect of the electrical field to take place on the C fibers. We want the hyposthesia to kick in on the A delta fibers. That kicks in about five minutes into the treatment. We get increased blood flow through the hemisphere uh, where that electrical field takes place. The increased blood flow is a secondary benefit. And so all this is going on during the first eight minutes of treatment. At the eight minute mark, we have to reduce the intensity of the treatment to take the edge off the sensation that the patient feels because uh, we don't want the sensation of the electrical field to limit the ability of the patient to move through the entire range of motion that the physical therapist or athletic trainer wants them to move through. So, uh, for example, if we're treating an upper extremity and the patient in the first eight minutes gets to 60% in in intensity on the biowave device, then we, at the eight minute mark, we want the patient to reduce the intensity by 10 percentage points or hit the minus button and take it down to 50. When you take it down to 50, now, when they begin to do their range of motion, say you're treating a shoulder and you want them to do TheraBand work, the patient can move more resistance through a greater range of motion with much less pain. The electrical field is removing the guarding effect associated with pain. So it's facilitating motion. So BioWave is facilitating motion and managing pain simultaneously. It makes it much easier for the patient to accomplish whatever your physical therapy or occupational therapy regimen is for that patient. Because of the long carryover effect with BioWave, there's little post-exercise soreness. So it's a wonderful tool, as I said, to facilitate motion and manage pain simultaneously. So for the physical therapy protocol, we're going to do an example. Uh, uh, let's say the patient has uh, medial knee pain, and then we're going to show what we're going to do uh, to be able to accomplish um, uh, eccentric quad work during the biowave treatment. So let's say the pain presents on the medial side of the knee. We're going to place the electrode in this location. We're going to place the um, dispersive electrode, uh, lateral aspect of the patella across the patellar tendon. Um, now very importantly, we need to place tape or wrap around the electrodes to help hold them in place. Uh, first we want to check the range of motion so when the patient goes through a complete range of motion the edges of the electrodes are not going to touch. So we're fine with this orientation of the electrodes. Next we're going to take some tape and we're going to wrap um, if you slide forward a little. We're going to wrap the tape around the electrodes to help hold them in place while the activity is taking place. Okay, you can go back to 90 degrees. Okay. Either connector can attach to either electrode. So the orientation doesn't matter. It can go either way. Either one can plug into either connector. There's no plus or minus. Uh, or, or polarity uh, with the electrodes. With this end, the cable, there's a red dot and a notch. Uh, they line up facing out. The notch on the cable right here lines up with a keyhole at 12 o'clock in the female part of the connector. It's if it's not lined up, it won't go in. If it's lined up, it slides in gently and then it clicks in place. Uh, to remove the cable, you don't uh, pull on the cord. Do not twist two fingers on the metal barrel and pull very gently uh, straight back, and that releases the cable from the connector. 
power buttons on the side of the device. You hold the power button down until the screen lights up. If the screen lights up and it reads 0.0%, you're all set to start. The setup is very fast. So the patient's going to control their intensity and they're going to increase the intensity so the sensation they feel is as strong as possible but still comfortable. So you're in control. When we hand this to the patient so the cord doesn't stick into their belly, we usually hand it to the patient so the rubber bumper is uh, against their belly and if they grab the unit here, the thumb naturally falls to the plus button. So you can start in increasing the intensity. You're gonna ramp it up uh, as so the sensation you feel is as strong as possible but still comfortable. If you hold the button down, after two seconds, it ramps at a steady rate. It doesn't go too fast, um, but that's uh, you want to. That's a, an easier way to to ramp it up a little bit more quickly. So now the patient's at a strong, steady state level. They're going to stay in this static position for eight minutes. Okay, and during that eight minute period, we want them to continue to increase the intensity to keep the sensation as strong as possible in the region that we're treating. The body adapts to the electrical field very quickly in the first few minutes of treatment. As the body adapts to the electrical field, the sensation diminishes. As the sensation diminishes, the patient should keep hitting the plus button to keep the sensation as strong as possible. Now, Eight minutes has passed and we're ready to start active or passive range of motion. So we're gonna take on a lower extremity, we're gonna reduce the intensity by five percentage points. So if this was at 21 and a half, we're gonna take it down. Now it reads 16 and a half. Um, uh, if we were at 60%, we would take it down to 55%. A typical treatment range for the knee is somewhere between 60 and 90%. Okay, so if the patient's at 60, take it down to 55 to take the edge off the sensation. Now, we're gonna start whatever your uh, physical therapy regimen is. So if the patient comes over here and we wanna do eccentric quad work, um, the, the cable is six feet long. The device can sit on the table. It can sit on the floor next to the patient. And now, um, if we want the patient to do a lunge, um, you can do a lunge while this is on. And it's much easier for the patient to get to 90 degrees doing the lunge than without BioWave because the electrical field is removing the guarding effect associated with pain. Another example of activity uh, during the treatment would be, for example, a passive range of motion. So let's say you have a post-operative knee patient, you're trying to get flexion in the knee. Uh, so after eight minutes of treatment, we take the intensity down by 5% because we're on a lower extremity. So if the patient's at 60% intensity, we take it down to 55. And now you're gonna start whatever your uh, treatment regimen is. So if we're trying to get extra flexion in the knee, um, uh, we can take this and you can push the knee, get an extra 10 degrees of, of flexion while BioWave is on than without. So the patient's more comfortable, you're, you're accomplishing a little bit greater range of motion, and so it's a great tool to facilitate accomplishing whatever your therapy regimen is. Another example of our physical therapy protocol, say on a foot or ankle, uh, we'll do an example of an ankle sprain and with the goal of trying to get your patient to do heel lifts or they could be doing activity on a BAPS board, uh, but for the purpose of this example, uh, we'll show heel lifts. So um, we've done uh, at the placement of the electrodes so that uh, the small pain site electrode, the small roundest electrode is directly over the pain site. The uh, dispersive pad is on the lateral malleolus, which is the comfortable place to receive stimulation. We are gonna have the patient go through a range of motion, so do a heel lift and we can see that those electrodes are not going to touch. So we just wanna ensure that that uh, is the case. Then we're going to take some tape and uh, wrap around the electrodes so that we help hold them in place.
we've we've placed cohesive wrap or tape around the electrodes on the foot and ankle to help hold the electrodes in place. We've done a static treatment for eight minutes. The patient has increased the intensity over that eight minute period to keep the sensation they feel at as strong a sensation as they can tolerate but still comfortable. And now at the eight minute mark, we've just reduced the intensity by 5% uh, and you could do it as much as 10%. The idea is you want to take the edge off the sensation that the patient feels so that they can get through the entire range of motion that you want them, that you want to take them through. So now the, the device is running and we've reduced the intensity. And for example, if you want your patient to do heel lifts, the patient can begin doing that activity. So it's so much easier to do a heel lift because the electrical field is removing the guarding effect associated with pain. So the patient can get through that range of motion uh, that you want them to accomplish. You could do this while on a BAPS board. You could, uh, the patient could be riding a bicycle um, while they're doing the treatment. Uh, and so again, it's a treatment that can facilitate motion, whether you're on an upper extremity, working on a shoulder, an elbow, or wrist, hand, or finger, or on um, a lower extremity like uh, a knee, a foot, or ankle, or you could be doing activity while you're treating the back or neck, certainly, as well example of our physical therapy protocol, uh, this time on an upper extremity, let's say the patient has uh, medial elbow pain, they're having difficulty getting to full extension, um, we're going to place the electrodes for the correct treatment, we're going to put them through uh, whatever range of motion they can get through to make sure these electrodes aren't going to touch, which is fine, um, and now uh, we're going to put wrap or tape around the electrodes to help hold them in place. If you want the patient to do some type of activity, for example, you could provide them a weight and they could do um, a, a weight bearing exercise or a resistance exercise. It's much easier for them to accomplish that exercise because the electrical field here is removing the guarding effect associated with pain. So this is again, it's a tool to help facilitate motion and have the patient accomplish whatever your occupational therapy regimen is. Operation of the device uh, is very simple. Uh, there's a power button on the side of the device. If you press that down and hold it until the screen lights up, then let go, uh, the device turns on. There's three points of connection that we check. We check where uh, the cable plugs into the unit and right now the, the display is telling you the cable with an arrow to the unit. The cable needs to be plugged into the unit. There's a red dot and a notch on the end of the, uh, the metal end of the, of the cable. Uh, this notch here mates with a keyhole at 12 o'clock on the female connector. It line, you have to line it up. If it's not lined up, it won't go. Once it slides in, then press the whole thing in and it clicks in place. Now the device is looking for the pads, two pads to be plugged into the cable. It doesn't see them, so it's saying two pads with an arrow to the cable. On this end, the electrode can be plugged in. The orientation doesn't matter. It can plug in this way. It can plug in this way. You do not need to squeeze the prongs. Uh, they just click into place. Either electrode can be plugged into either connector. So you just push. It clicks. It purposely sticks out this far so you've got something to grab onto. So at the end of the treatment, you just grab and pull it apart. So it's very simple to use. When these two electrodes are plugged in, now is the most important of the three error conditions. The unit shows two pads with an arrow to the body. If you're all hooked up to the patient and you see this error condition, it means the device does not see the pads on the body. It means the impedance of the skin is too high. So if you did not clean the skin first prior to treatment, then you need to remove the electrodes, clean the skin thoroughly with a damp towel, rub vigorously in the two locations that 
uh, the electrodes are going to be placed. The rubbing action helps to exfoliate the skin, remove oil, lotion, dead skin cells, and what you've done is you've reduced the impedance of the skin. Now, you have to also make sure that the electrode is tacky. If it's not, you need to use a new set of electrodes to ensure good conduction through the skin. If you clean the skin and the electrode has good adhesion, uh, then this error condition will go away and the screen will, be, will start with 0.0. .0. Operation of the device is very simple. There's a power button on the side of the device. If you press that down and hold it until the screen lights up, then let go, uh, the device turns on. There's three points of connection that we check. We check where uh, the cable plugs into the unit, and right now the, the display is telling you the cable with an arrow to the unit. The cable needs to be plugged into the unit. There's a red dot and a notch on the end of the uh, the metal end of the, of the cable. Uh, this notch here mates with a keyhole at 12 o'clock on the female connector. It line, you have to line it up. If it's not lined up, it won't go. Once it slides in, then press the whole thing in and it clicks in place. Now the device is looking for the pads, two pads to be plugged into the cable. It doesn't see them, so it's saying two pads with an arrow to the cable. On this end, the electrode can be plugged in. The orientation doesn't matter. It can plug in this way. It can plug in this way. You do not need to squeeze the prongs. Uh, they just click into place. Either electrode can be plugged into either connector. So you just push, it clicks. It purposely sticks out this far so you've got something to grab onto. So at the end of the treatment, you just grab and pull it apart. So it's very simple to use. When these two electrodes are plugged in, now is the most important of the three error conditions. The unit shows two pads with an arrow to the body. If you're all hooked up to the patient and you see this error condition, it means the device does not see the pads on the body. It means the impedance of the skin is too high. So if you did not clean the skin first prior to treatment, then you need to remove the electrodes clean the skin thoroughly with a damp towel, rub vigorously in the two locations that uh, the electrodes are going to be placed. The rubbing action helps to exfoliate the skin, remove oil, lotion, dead skin cells, and what you've done is you've reduced the impedance of the skin. Now, you have to also make sure that the electrode is tacky. If it's not, you need to use a new set of electrodes to ensure good conduction through the skin. If you clean the skin and the electrode has good adhesion, uh, then this error condition will go away and the screen will, be, will start with 0.0. .0. If the whole system is hooked up correctly to the patient, so the cable is plugged into the unit, the other end of the cable is plugged into the electrodes, and the electrodes are attached to the body, the unit should read 0.0%, and there should be no error conditions showing on the screen. If that's the case, you're all set to begin the treatment, and to begin the treatment, you simply start pressing the plus button. The screen shows the intensity, the scale goes from 0 to 100 um, percent. It goes up in 0.5 percent increments with each press of the plus button. If you hold the plus button down, after a couple of seconds it starts advancing at a faster pace, but not too fast. The lower left corner is the set time. It's set preset to 30 minutes. The countdown timers in the center and the battery indicators on the other corner. When a patient starts out, uh, they're going to increase the intensity of the signal based on the sensation that they feel. They should increase the intensity pressing the plus button to keep the sensation as strong as possible, but still comfortable. It's subjective and it's a different, it means something different to each person, but it should be up to tolerance, but the treatment should always be comfortable. So as the patient increases the intensity, within the first three, four, or five minutes of the treatment, the body adapts to the electrical field and the sensation felt by the patient begins to diminish. 
As the sensation diminishes, the patient should press the plus button again to keep the sensation at a strong, steady level throughout the treatment. So, for example, it's a 30 minute duration treatment. Two minutes into the treatment, if the patient's at 40% intensity, and this is a, for a static 30 minute pain treatment, um, if by the end of the 30 minutes, the patient should be at approximately 60% intensity. There's about a 20 point swing from the end of two minutes to the end of 30 minutes. The typical intensity reached by the end of the treatment for a back or shoulder tends to be between 40 and 60% of max intensity. For foot and for knee, foot, ankle, and knee, the typical range of intensity reaches 60 to 90%. Patients typically can tolerate more intensity in those regions. For the neck, for elbow, for wrist, hand, finger, uh, it's more difficult to tolerate a greater sensation. So the typical range tends to be 30% to 50% intensity for those parts of the body. Some patients will go up to higher intensities. Some patients will be at lower intensities, but that's uh, the, the bell curve for, for those typical locations. Now we're going to discuss the application of the percutaneous electrode. This is for biowave pens. So first thing is uh, you've identified where the pain presents. Uh, you've identified is there a single location of pain, two locations of pain. So for this example, we're going to do a bilateral lumbar placement. So the patient has indicated oh, first you're going to palpate. You're going to find the center of the location of each pain site. If, in this example, if these are the two locations of pain, we're gonna mark those locations with a Sharpie. So palpate, find the center of the pain site, mark it with a Sharpie. Palpate, find the center of the pain site, mark it with a Sharpie. And this is the center of where we're gonna be placing the percutaneous electrodes. Next, we have to clean the skin with an alcohol prep. This is as if we were gonna uh, uh, do an injection. Uh, so we take an alcohol prep and we're going to clean the location that the percutaneous electrode is going to be placed. So we clean this whole location, make sure you can still see the center of the Sharpie location. The percutaneous electrodes are sterile, single use. They're in a vapor-proof foil pack. You open, the top, you open them from the top, peel the pack apart, and we've got two percutaneous electrodes. Uh, we recommend not wearing gloves while you place these because the gloves will stick to the hydrogel that's around the perimeter of the electrodes. It's easier to place these without you cannot touch the needle array once you open up these percutaneous electrodes. The plastic cup which protects the needles, that needs to be peeled off. And please do not just yank it off quickly. You want to peel around the perimeter of this electrode. So we peel it back starting where the wire is so that you peel right to where the array, the metal array starts to show up. Then we peel around the perimeter very gently. I have my three fingers on the back of the electrode and we do not want to kink the metal array where the needles are located. So if you peel it, take two seconds to peel it off. We have the array of needles. There's 1,014 needles within this two and a half inch diameter patch. The needles are three quarters of a millimeter in length. Uh, they're made from a surgical grade stainless steel. And again, this is a sterile single use electrode and it has to go in Sharpe's disposal following the treatment. Uh, when we place this electrode, we're gonna place it with typically the wire running down so the weight of the connector does not pull on the electrode. Do not touch the metal array with your fingers. This is sterile. Uh, we're gonna place this centered over the Sharpie mark that's on the skin. 
So we're going to place this directly over that location and we're going to just for the time being uh, touch around the perimeter where the hydrogel is to hold that in place. Now we're going to do the same thing. We're not, we have not yet insert the needle array through the epidermis. We're going to take the second percutaneous electrode, peel it back very gently, go around the perimeter, peel off the cup, and similarly we're going to take this second percutaneous electrode, place it over the center of the Sharpie mark that we made where we've cleaned the skin, place that, um, and again just use the touch around the perimeter to put it in place. Now you have to ask your patient if you're in a treatment room with a table or a chair to um, brace against the table or chair because we're going to apply pressure on the back side of the electrode. So, um, and we have to apply about 10 pounds of force. And we want to start by first placing our thumbs together centered over the center of the electrode. And um, we're going to do three presses. We're going to press with the thumbs at the center, with the thumbs at 12 and 6 o'clock, not all the way at the edge, but over where the metal array is, and then with the thumbs at uh, 9 o'clock and 3 o'clock, again, not all the way to the edge, but over where the metal array is. So if we do those three presses, like in the center, above, and to the side, that will ensure that all 1014 needles are completely inserted through the epidermis. So we're going to tell the patient, now the needles don't hurt, but we're applying pressure over a painful location on the body because the electrode must be placed directly over the location of pain. So it's a little bit of discomfort for the patient for approximately the one to two seconds that you're inserting the needles through the epidermis. So are we ready? Mm -hmm. So we're going to press firmly. You can see how much pressure I'm applying. That's then we're going to do at six and 12 o'clock. Then we're going to press at nine and three o'clock. Okay. So this electrode is now inserted through the epidermis. Now we're going to do the same for the other electrode. So we're going to press now at with the thumbs together in the center. We're going to press at 12 and at 6. And we're going to press at 9 and at 3. So that's, that's what it takes to insert the needle array through the skin. When we're done with the treatment, we can remove the percutaneous electrode. You're going to see a pink circle and typically you'll see uh, four to five tiny drops of blood. You can take dry gauze, sterile gauze, and clean off any tiny drops of blood that are there. There's no dressing that's required. The pink circle resolves typically in about one to two hours post-treatment. If the patient has very sensitive skin, it may take 24 hours for the pink circle to resolve.